Right, um, I suppose I'll start. Um, my name is Seamus Keane. I'm uh, with Ericsson. I work in our cloud business unit. I'm going to take about 35, 40 minutes today just to talk to you about um, the economics of cloud and some of the learnings that we've had around putting uh, NFE on top of OpenStack for operator customers. Um, walking around the booths for the last couple of days, I mean, I, I know a lot of people are sort of uh, don't seem to know a huge amount about Ericsson. Um, I'm assuming this audience has a reasonably good idea, but I mean, Ericsson's vision or intent is that uh, we, we see ourselves as being uh, a company that can help uh, any industry out there and, or, and individuals uh, achieve their full potential and full capacity. Um, and for us, a cloud is a big part of that. Um, and particularly, cloud is an enabler uh, for companies to allow them to compete more effectively and, and to accelerate the speed at which they can go to market with their products and, and disrupt and, and be successful in the future. Um, and, and that's what a lot of operators are, are trying to use cloud for as well. But of course, uh, the, the theory and the practice are two different things. And the question is, is how do you actually get there? Um, and when it comes to NFV, uh, there's two types of questions that I'm, I'm sort of hearing from operators when we, we go out and talk to them. Uh, the, the first one is, is, how do we actually do this transformation? Uh, what's involved from a technology, from a roadmap? Um, how do we make that journey from, from A to B? Um, and secondly, more immediately, can you help us uh, explain why we should do this and justify it? Um, and that's not just what, what we hear. I mean, if you, there's a report here from Infinetics, uh, and 52% of uh, carriers sort of identified cost benefits as being a particular issue uh, when it comes to looking at uh, uh, adopting NFV and, and, and going down that road. Um, so in, in, in looking to season, so what we can do for them, I mean, one of the first things you'll do is, well, okay, so people want to know what's the TCO benefits from doing this. Well, you, you go back and you look at, well, how has this worked out in the IT world? Uh, Cloud in the IT space been around for a long time, relatively mature, very well known. And, and that gives us a good start point. But the problem is, of course, that when you look at NFE and you look at telco cloud, it's, it's very different in terms of um, an environment and, a, and an endpoint that you're looking to get to. Um, and, the, and the key thing, of course, are the di very different demands. Um, the, the first one is, I mean, if you look at it as a, from a, an application point of view, I mean, a telco network has a much smaller number of applications, but they're very tightly integrated with uh, uh, a much greater degree of independency than you would find in a, in a standard IT data center. Uh, secondly, we're, we're fundamentally talking about moving a network into the cloud, and that, cl uh, that network has a, a shape um, and has very complex service chains and requirements, which also must be, be managed and, and carefully transitioned over. Um, carrier grade performance, it's a, a term which means different things to different people, but it has requirements in terms of latency, predictability, reliability that also have to be met. Um, and then, of course, the other thing is, is from a technology standpoint, I mean, we, we've come to the understanding that it's not possible to virtualize everything today. When you look at a telco network, OSS, BSS, uh, elements around the control planes, that can be done today, but if you move right out to the edge of the network, routers, access, um, it's very specialized very high performance requirements, and we're, we're not really uh, ready to do that just now. And that's probably going to be the last thing on, on the journey to NFE that has to be done. So looking at all of that, I mean, um, while the, uh, the IT experience and the IT learnings gave us a start point, uh, we sort of came to the recognition that we had to build a model that, that looks at this early from a, a telco point of view. So uh, we've been building a model that looks at NFE, um, and, and because Ericsson is building our NFE uh, architecture primarily on OpenStack, uh, we've built a model that looks at, then so what are the, the TCO implications for an operator coming purely at an NFE point of view and not just as IT. So the, the model we look at and, and, and the numbers and what I'm going to talk about today is sort of based around this sort of a starting point. We, we look at OSS, BSS, uh, the OpenStack, the NFE functionality itself, um, and then, of course, uh, a range of the core network functions that are, are within that that would be virtualized over time. Okay, um, and each of those, then we, we we pull out capex, we pull out opex, um, and we broke those down into different layers. So within the capex, hardware, software, and, and SI, we reckon were the probably the most important components to look at. And from an opex point of view, again, the hardware, software, facilities, which is more around data center, heat, light, power, uh, and then operations and support costs as well. Okay. 
from a, an actual cost numbers perspective, we, we took a top-down approach to looking at, uh, at these because it, it's, it's probably the, the, the fastest way to do this. Um, and we start looking at the overall cost structure for the, the whole operator. So if you, just to give an example on CapEx, and I, I won't drill into the numbers or anything, we, we start with a typical operator, you've got uh, about 15%, 10 to 15% CapEx to sales. About 75 of that percent is your access and your backhaul, so the, the towers, the, the radio units. But about 25% of that then is the core and the management, the OSS, BSS. And we start from that 25% and then break that down into the major elements, OSS, BSS, EPC, communication services, IMS, and so on, and break those into, as I said, again, hardware, software, and uh, SI. And we, we've done something similar around the OPEX. So important to note then, so when you see the numbers here, what I'm talking about is not cost on a particular function. We're looking at the full cost uh, for an operator to actually run and manage this on an annual basis. Okay. Um, and then in the modeling, the, the, the key inputs that we put in, current CapEx, current OpEx, um, and the two big drivers on that, of course, then is well, what are growth estimates? Um, most of our operators are seeing very large growth in, in very dynamic markets, so that has to be factored in. And then we take, of course, the, the plans for virtualization. What should be done fast and at what rate? Um, and of course, the, the most important thing then is, is what are the actual impacts of virtualization? Um, and I'll, I'll spend a bit of time talking about that, and then we, we output, run that through the model and, and get a set of output TCO and, and, and NFE type numbers. Okay. So when you're on the virtualization impacts, I mean, these are the, the big variables that, that drive the case for any particular operator. Uh, and some of the key ones like that we, we've identified are here. I mean, the, probably the primary one that, that most people start thinking about is, is on the hardware side. To what degree are the, the, the servers, the number of servers that we have out there going to consolidate? Uh, we have 100 today, how many are we going to have tomorrow? Um, automation and the degree of SI that's associated with that is, a, is another huge variable. Um, and this uh, we found as well as tends to be something that, that there's a great degree of um, variability between operator and between the plans that they, they have. If you have, uh, or if you're willing to accept a large amount of SI and not willing to do amount of, uh, uh, a significant amount of automation, then that's going to change the CapEx to OpEx mix. Um, transformation and migration options also tied to that. How fast do you want to move? What do you want to do first? Um, are you going to, is IMS the most important thing to you? Do you want to do EPC? Um, distributed versus centralized. When you move to a, an NFE type architecture, you don't necessarily assume that everything is going to be run out of a centralized uh, a data center. Um, one of the, the capabilities that NFE does unlock is the ability to push an awful lot of processing out to the edge of the network where that makes most sense to do. Uh, so again, what is the best way to do that? And that, that does have uh, cost implications. And then there's a, a few other scaling, disaster recovery, continuity, and so on. Um, a point I did make is that we, we have found that this is very sensitive to the particular operator starting point. We've got operators out there who've never in installed IMS. Um, we've operators who are, have it and aren't quite happy with it. But there's a big SI overhead on that. So as I show you some numbers here, this is sort of for a typical case for, for an operator we looked at already. But different operators will have different sets of numbers that, that come out of this. Okay. So if we look at a, a real-world scenario, and this is a, a, a case that we modeled recently. Uh, it's an operator running with uh, over about 50 million subscribers. Uh, they've got two, three, and 4G services. Uh, big focus on mobile data and, and growing quite aggressively. About 10 to 15% capacity growth needed uh, in any given year. Uh, and we modeled out about uh, five years. Uh, and looking at this operator from discussions we had with them, their ambition would be to virtualize everything uh, by about 2020. So they've got a three to four year timeline to, to complete their, their uh, move to NFE. Um, and we model a couple of different scenarios. Uh, and we, the, the scenario that I'm going to talk through today just sort of assumes uh, you start with EPC. And in your first year, you virtualize about 20% of that. So you'd have both legacy and NFE architecture operating alongside each other. And then uh, you'd bring additional applications onto the platform, IMS, OSS, BSS, and then the rest of the core functionality, taking about another three years or so to virtualize that. So that by the end of about four years, you'd have virtualized the full network. And then the last set of numbers that you'd see here then are the, the, the fully virtualized environment. Uh, so you get some ideas for, for overall cost impacts when it's the transition is complete. Okay. Um, so this is the, the, the first graph I'll show on numbers. So um, green is non-virtualized. This is your do nothing, and orange would be the, the virtualized. And looking at uh, capex from a capex point of view, I mean, what you can see is through the time period from about 2015 to 2018, when the, the network would be virtualized, we're seeing not significant amounts of difference in, in terms of cost. 
Um, the reason for that is the, the first initial applications, you're just doing EPC and you're only doing a small part of it, so there's not a, a massive overhead in cost, there's some savings. But one of the things we've, we've learned and we've noticed is that as you, once you build your platform and there's a cost to establish it, there are benefits that are unlocked, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about those as we go on. But as they, those benefits start to come more and more downstream, there are synergies as you bring more and more applications onto the platform. Uh, so while in some ways you're, you're increasing your investment, as you virtualize more and more of those applications, you're also seeing more and more benefits. And the two things seem to be broadly cancelling out until the point where your network is fully virtualized and you're no longer having to put that investment in to build a platform, and then you start to see the overall gains. So um, when we ran the model in this case, you've got uh, over the, the, the full five years, the, the total gains in terms of your spend difference would be about only one or two percent, uh, but by the time the network is fully virtualized, your annual capex is down about eight or nine percent on where it would have been to, as a start point. Uh, so that some gains there. Uh, the bigger difference, though, is on on the opex side, um, and here. Uh, again, in the first year or two, uh, because you're only doing a limited number of applications, there aren't huge benefits. But um, then as you go on further, more and more of the operational gains start to come, and you begin to see a very rapid divergence then as you bring more apps onto the platform and, and you move to a fully virtualized uh, telco cloud. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But uh, again, by the time the, the full network is complete in 2019, we were seeing about 25% reduction in, in the OPEX for the, the core, the OSS, and the BSS components. All right. So just looking at the like, where is that? Where the the benefits coming from? If you if you take the uh, the capex side, so um, the axis is, is non-zero because it's it's a rather large pool of spend. So I just sort of compressed it. Uh, so this is what you're doing non-virtualized uh, by 2019. So when you would have fully completed, if you if you had not virtualized anything, this would be your spend, and this is where you end up uh, once you have moved everything over to an NFE implementation on on OpenStack. So the, the biggest reduction uh, in terms of an individual component is, is the hardware. Uh, that would come down by about 80% overall. And that's based on what we've seen in terms of industry expectations, some analysts, and also what we've done in terms of our own internal modeling. Um, and that gives you your biggest uh, chunk of the reduction. But at the same time, there is a, an offset in terms of the SI to, to manage the more complex uh, environment that you've now built. Um, and you claw back about half the gains. So some savings, but not massive. And then down here we have the, the, the additional software costs, primarily for the Im implementing your, your cloud platform. Okay. Um, and then over here we've got the, the operational side. So again, non-virtualized, where would you be if you have to add your 15% capacity for uh, five years versus this is where you, are, you, you come out on the vir fully virtualized. And it, again, it's a, it's a non-zero axis. So, some savings in, in terms of the hardware, um, about half what you would have in terms of the capex, because while you can save from moving from NEBS to uh, COTS, you, you still do have to maintain a similar number of servers or a smaller number of servers. Uh, some increase around uh, software, some reduction on facilities, but very big savings around operations, about 20 to or 25 to 30 percent there. So that's that's where the, the, the key gains are coming, and and that's in terms of the the support, the management costs, and the, the cost to launch and manage new services on the, the cloud platform that you have built. Okay. So if we look just uh, taking a minute or two around the, the CapEx, uh, as I said, this is uh, two sets of numbers now. So this is your, your start point today, uh, non-virtualized network, and then five years later, everything's fully virtualized. And you can see overall CapEx has gone up, but there's, there's two factors that are happening here at the same time. First of all, the, um, you're, you're having to continue to increase capacity. As I said, we're assuming about 10 to 15% capacity growth in the network as you go on year by year. So you have to account for that. But at the same time, then you're virtualizing and you're moving into a, a, a cloud NFE architecture. Um, so on the one hand, you're adding capacity, but on the other hand, then you're, you're making savings through the, the virtualization. Um, and if you, you balance those two out, I mean, the, the, the main thing you can see is that overall the, the hardware component as a, a percentage of your total spend drops from, goes from about a fifth down to about 5%. Um, so there's a big saving there, but then, as I said, you, you are, are continuing to spend on SI and on software as, as you go along. Um, so while there are savings net, you are, they are being offset by continuing having to spend. But so that's primarily because you are building capacity on the network. This is not a static picture which, which comparing to like, point, uh, like start and end point. Um, 
the other thing then is, is because of the mix of the, the software and the SI that's in there, that's very dependent on the types of applications that you're looking at. If you take something like OSS and BSS, there's a very high SI component on them today, even in a, a, a non-cloud environment. But when you virtualize that, that's not going to change significantly. You will still have to do a large amount of SI even on, on cloud versions of those. Uh, whereas other applications, you, you will be able to automate and you'll be able to instantiate these in a much faster, uh, simpler, and, and cheaper way. Okay. So then if we look at the, uh, on the OPEX side, um, and here, uh, I mean, the biggest reductions, again, are on the, on the operations side. But that's also partially because, of course, about 70% of your cost is actually on, on the operations and the support. Um, everything, spare part management, software update, patching, isn't really that significant. It's the, the going out and the managing the applications and the services is where the, the primary cost is today. Um, and, and that is what we've seen from the, the numbers. And again, this depends a little bit on the, on the customer and, and their situation and, and to what degree they, they can automate the services and the applications. Uh, we worked through a number of different scenarios with the, the case we were looking at here. Um, but in terms of ongoing SI, vendor support, network DevOps, th there's big opportunities there to, to reduce the cost. And again, even though the, the network capacity has gone up and you're managing a larger, or you're, you're servicing more users, greater data, uh, the actual OPEX total has gone down over time, although the, uh, as opposed to the, the CapEx side where you, you still have to spend an increasing amount. Um, there's some increase around the, the software and so on for the virtualization, but it's, it's not significant. Um, and then the most important point is, I mean, the, I didn't put these two graphs on the same slide, but I mean, typical OPEX to, to sales ratio for an operator is about 60, 65%. So if we're talking about small reductions here versus the, the potential CapEx gains, you're actually talking in terms of annual numbers, uh, what you're going to save on OPEX is about 10 to 15 times what you would save on CapEx per year. Um, so what it means is that even in the case that you were able to make very large uh, savings on the capex, they're, they're far outweighed by uh, the cash potential that you can free up on the on the opex side instead. Okay. Um, so just to, to quickly sort of summarize some of the key things on that. I mean, the first of all is there are capex gains there. Um, as I said, about 10% on an annual basis. Um, but they're not massive, um, and I know certainly when um, NFE sort of appeared on the radar uh, two, three years ago, there was a feeling that this was an area you could, you could generate an awful lot of savings. They can be achieved, but at the same time, the, the main benefits are coming around the OPEX side. It is operational benefits uh, that are going to generate the, the greatest opportunity and potential within the, within the business for, for freeing up cash. Um, the other thing we found is, is this, the synergies are very important. The first couple of applications, you, you set up your cloud platform, you bring on a, an EPC or an IMS or something like that, you won't really see significant gains and you probably will cost yourself money. But as you bring on more and more applications onto the platform, uh, you build up momentum and you start to, to, to really uh, to, to, to build up speed in terms of the benefits and, and achieving the potential that you want there. Um, also, the, the numbers I put up here, they're, they're very dependent on the particular situation. We had an operator here who was quite advanced, uh, a, a lot of work gone into building and operating a, a relatively mature network. Different operators will have different configurations, there'll be different plans, so how exactly it works will, will depend on the customer. So, I mean, if I take all of that, I mean, a, a key takeaway then really is that um, getting the TCO gains isn't really a technology problem. Um, and that, that's what we've learned from just looking at these numbers. You can take your, your legacy architecture, you can move to a, a fully virtualized one. Um, as I said, we, we're looking at uh, moving all our applications onto to OpenStack, and you, you can put that in, and you can swap legacy with virtualized. Um, but if that's all you do, you, you won't really see significant cost benefits. Um, there's a lot more required. Um, Putting in OpenStack gives you a platform, but you still need to do a lot more to, to unlock potential, or the unlock the potential that's in there. I mean, and that is primarily around the operational side. Um, automation of, of processes, service, uh, services, um, new service creation, uh, looking at how you uh, run and manage your network. Those are the things that will generate the, the big savings and, and, and really um, give you the benefits that the platform uh, provides. So coming from that point, I mean, um, and we've been looking at this for a while. I mean, this, this is sort of driving some of the areas that Ericsson then has been looking at. Um, and the first is around orchestration. I mean, we're, we've decided that total orchestration is key here. 
Um, so in terms of cloud automation, governance, uh, provisioning, security and management, these things are all important because they do aid the, the operational benefits and, and generating the, the uh, below the line savings that we're looking for here. Uh, this, the second thing, of course, then is around the, the, the revenues, and I haven't really touched on this today because it was primarily just talking about the, the costs. Um, putting in cloud as a platform, I mean, in some ways, yeah, you can save some on the, on the hardware side, you will save on some operational costs, but I mean, one of the biggest reasons to do this is to accelerate uh, your ability to, to roll out services. Um, both in, in the, the near term for an operator, they, they're going to have to do this in order to be able to compete more effectively with their own customers, but also if you look wider at the OTT and the IT players who are coming in on their area more, op, uh, more and more so, um, we need to be able to launch and iterate services in days and weeks rather than months and years the way it has traditionally been, and that's one of the key drivers here. So it's, it's what can the platform do in terms of allowing you to generate new revenues. Um, and also then there's, there's other benefits in terms of greater reliability and greater uh, service resilience because that drives customer retention, which also is one of the, the, the big cost drivers in, in an OPEX area that, that wasn't directly covered in the model. And then the final thing is around uh, implementation is another key one. Um, so in terms of doing the migration, that has to be managed properly as well. And this is, a, this is one of the technology areas. So there's a, a large number of risks associated with implementing a large technology stack like this. Um, we've, you're talking about multi-vendor integration, uh, new application, uh, uh, new technology uh, implementation as well, and ensuring the, the full stack interoperability is key there. Um, and we've been able to do a number of things on this in the past, and we've also announced uh, the OP NFE uh, certification initiative this week. Uh, so I'm just going to hand over to Shannon Ang, and she'll, she'll talk to you very quickly just a little bit about yes. that and, and how that also benefits on this too. Yeah, great. Thanks. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Chen Gan Yu. I'm working very soon at uh, Group Function Technology on cloud. And I've been working with basic mobile network planning implementation and uh, optimization for the past 20 years. Like just now was mentioned, like we truly, uh, you know, what we see the, the challenge for operators today to go ahead with, uh, you know, virtualization and cloudification is truly the concern about interoperability and the multi-vendor compliance. And uh, again, performance guarantee. I guess you all recall that uh, in the you know, main whole session, like was a question to uh, basic uh, the telecom uh, representative saying, you know, what are the things the OpenStack community is supposed to focus on to help the tackle you know, operators to be confident that they can speed up the virtualization and the cloudification activities. So as mentioned that, um, uh, since last Thursday, Arizona made an uh, uh, announcement, a press release, that we actually would like to launch something called Open NFE Certification Program, uh, with a focus on saying that we want to lead the community, saying we need to have a joint effort to address this uh, interoperability and multi-vendor challenge. So we want to highlight, this is not uh, Arizona certification, it's not a vendor-specific certification. We want to drive this together with the community as an industry certification. So the ambition is here very much saying we want to have a creative environment so we can jointly certify all the vendors for the so-called uh, compliance to standards and compliance to the reference platform. So that's the thinking that we have that uh, in terms of multi-vendor compliance and also this, uh, like was mentioned, the full stack interoperability. So end-to-end -end performance <laughs> should be the focus. So from the VNF, uh, you know, like uh, in general, like we, we should be able to identify what are the VNF, uh, you know, the workload we would like to work on. So that as an ambition that we set the performance requirement clearly from the start, and then jointly that with all the vendors, we can actually address the challenges and make sure that truly we have a working, you know, basically a production um, um, compliant uh, solution jointly. So in terms of performance, as I said, this is uh, where much the challenge operators are facing today. It's not only about the end user requirement, it's very much about compliance to the regulatory requirements, as we all understand. Because like 5.9 or 6.9 requirements are very much the, the most challenging ta task, I would say, the telecom operators are facing today. Uh, and a minute of downtime actually not only cause, I would say, uh, you know, loss of revenue, also, it's also causing that, uh, you know, they're basically compliance to the regulatory requirement. 
Then in the end, I think uh, our focus, as I mentioned, that very much will be the WNF portability and the NFEI compliance. Uh, so that in terms of uh, the, you know, how we're going to set up the, the, the testing environment and how we're going to jointly work with uh, all the partners here in the community, this is very much, I would say, the focus uh, for us in the coming months. Uh, then people are actually asking, how, why do we call it Open NFE certification, certification Program? The thinking is very much uh, to, you know, as was mentioned, that uh, the Linux Foundation announced the OP and the v initiative about months ago. And our ambition is to truly uh, very much aligned with this initiative, to see this as the standard reference platform for us to work jointly. And then, of course, in terms of uh, other for us, we do know that there, there are other, you know, basically industry for us are also driving interface and functionality alignment, etc. So that's very much also our focus as saying that we need to work uh, across the industry with, uh, you know, basically uh, the ambition so that we can jointly align on the, on the focus. For example, the phase one of uh, OPNV will be very much to create a reference platform where we truly can start working, uh, have a production um, you know, solution. Then the second phase will be very much focused on the, the Manu part, which has been very much uh, requested by the operators today. Yeah? So in general, I think, uh, as a summary, our ambition is to saying that, as I mentioned, we want to work together with you, all of you here in the community, so that we truly provide not only the open source, uh, you know, based solution, but truly working solution uh, to our telecom customers. And today, as I mentioned, uh, no single vendor can guarantee performance. And that's the challenge for the, for the community jointly. So we need to work together on this. And then in the end, as mentioned just now, that in terms of uh, the process, message tools, we need to also rethink, and there will be re-engineering, there will be a lot of uh, things we need to work together. In particular, I would say, related to onboarding tools, related to automation, and again, going back to planning, implementation, and uh, optimization of the network. This is the biggest challenge, I would say, for the community to move forward. Uh, so, I would say, uh, finally, I would like to highlight, Arizona, again, as the Telecom vendor, the leading telecom vendor, we definitely believe that this is our responsibility. We would, like to take to, we would like to take the lead to drive the community forward, saying this is a joint effort that we are investing uh, uh, in our, how to say, existing mobile vendor, how to, multi vendor verification capability and IoT facilities we have today worldwide. We have many labs around, but we would like to start with. Uh, uh, focusing and saying that we provide uh, this um, environment in a distributed cloud uh, fashion so that all the, all the customers worldwide would have access to this environment. But we will initially start with uh, uh, having the equipment in two locations, one in Europe and one in the US. So this is very much, uh, the, again, uh, effort we would like to see that um, and like, uh, I would say, a community effort, and we welcome all our customers and the partners to uh, come to us so we can jointly start this activity then. Yeah? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we have a few minutes if there's questions. Uh, so yep. One question goes out to... Uh, sorry. One question comes down to, on your, your TCO study, did you use uh, software as, a, as, as freeware, or did you use a service around that's from like Red Hat or Ubuntu? Um, this would have uh, assumed the, the Arison implementation, so we would run uh, OpenStack uh, for the virtualization platform, and we, we do have some of our own software around the, the cloud system to, to manage uh, the network applications that are running then once we, we set it up. So there'd be a license fee around that? Or yeah, there okay. would be. And that was, uh, if, if on the grass, there was a small increase on, on software costs, and that was primarily to, to cover that. Great. And then another question in terms of certification. Who would be the holder of that certification? Would Ericsson grant that certification, or there would be a, a test that everybody agreed to and would be available? Yeah, this is definitely will be a community work, like you said. But Ericsson would like to take the lead to init initiate it. So currently, we're working closely with OpenV test and performance community. And would, um, would, other, would other test locations be available, say, in, in Asia as well? Or? For sure, for sure. As I said, we have globally like uh, labs around the globe. And the ambition is saying we want to start uh, with uh, 
a few locations, and it truly depends on the requirement from the customers. As I said, like any operators, like operators in Asia will benefit from this already from day one. So even the equipment actually is in US or in Europe, it doesn't really matter because that's the distributed cloud thinking. Yeah. So, so any, any company could do the test and just say, okay, we're compliant with this, and you could do it at Ericsson's place or some other place as well. You should be do be able to, you know, that's the discussion ongoing, okay, saying great. that, you know, what exactly would be the, the right way, you know, the best way for, for the customers to, to, you know, the partners to, to uh, uh, again, to have an environment truly working. Uh, you know, we believe that today, for example, like in the Ericsson uh, booth uh, demo, we actually have equipment in Montreal, but we're actually showing here in Paris. It works uh, perfectly fine. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. your TCO calculation. I, yeah. I, maybe I'm uh, missing the first part. Where <laughs> is your fundament of this? Is it a real customer uh, is it operator case or is it in a lab condition? This was a, a real operator case. So we, we took live uh, uh, cost base from a, an existing operator, looked at their existing network, and then uh, had worked through a number of different scenarios for how we would recommend they virtualize. Uh, and then we, we, we've did that analysis with them. We've done with a couple of other customers, but I, I just selected that one as a sort of a, a typical case for today. Uh, and the operator, what you work with, then is agrees this calculation. Uh, they, s they were, uh, their view was that the numbers were pretty much in line with with what they had expected themselves, yeah, okay. and, and what they had calculated internally. We we took a slightly bigger picture. They were looking sort of on an application by application <laughs> level. We looked across the full network and, and their total cost base, but they were they were pretty much happy that there was nothing radically different to what they had already calculated internally. Uh, this means, if I understood correctly, it's not one operator, it's several operators. Uh, th this was one operator, although we have done a similar modeling exercise with a couple of other operators as well. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm Marie Paulodini from HP. Um, I'm on the HCNLV and so on, uh, and also OPNLV. We had yes. a meeting yesterday, the technical meeting, and definitely, you know, testing and, I mean, OPNLV has this um, objective, you know, to have this uh, package uh, solution and this infrastructure on the Linux foundation to allow, you know, doing HackFest, uh, interoperability testing and so on. There is a team defining the test and so on. So all of that is very much in line with the objective of the industry. At the same time, uh, you know, every vendor has its open labs. I mean, HP has, you know, right. free worldwide and so on. So I guess, you know, I mean, many vendors will be doing uh, testing and certification right. according to the specifications. Um, the requirement for the telco is really to deploy, you know, um, telecom uh, solutions mm -hmm. and telecom functions and so on. So do you intend to have live network as a test bed? Like a live yeah. net mobile network as a test right, bed right. or things like that? Uh, that's exactly the point. I think I probably was not clear in the last slides. Like, uh, you know, in terms of uh, mobile, uh, you know, again, multi-vendor verification and interoperability testing, Arizona has been doing together with, uh, you know, all the vendors or uh, potential vendors for the past 20 years. So we've been doing very much in the live environment. We have extensive uh, facilities worldwide. And that's exactly the ambition. We believe that we need to have a live network environment you wanted to do the proper testing. This is not uh, a simple demo or like a simulation. We want to do, again, a live network testing. So truly make sure that once you certify in this environment, you actually are ready for production. So that's right. very much the thinking then. Yeah, yeah. But I think that's the int very interesting thing, you know, to, uh, I mean, to communicate and to document, you know, what is the type of live network that you put right. in place. Yes. Whether it's uh, 3G, LTE, broadband. I mean, we have everything broad. today. <laughs> yes, we have everything today. Okay. And that's exactly the, the, the belief we have, that uh, instead of creating something new from scratch, and you're definitely right, there are many vendors today have their own certification. We're not saying we're going to replace uh, all right. the existing ones, it's but we want to... It's very complementary, probably. Exactly. Yeah. We want to take, uh, like you're saying, a complementary approach, but with a focus on live network traffic, and, you know, again, all the I.O. type of scenarios we need to consider. Because there have been many thousand test cases have been run with all different labs, but now we need to hold uh, the whole effort together. Then That's the thinking, yeah. Thank you. Um, as, as you are leading the certification program, I wonder how you want, want to drive this multi-vendor verification when there is no standard party uh, um, dealing with uh, actual orchestration and managing of the VNF function. Right. So, uh, so how do you want to uh, convince the 
the telcos which are uh, seeking for an yeah, actual open source uh, implementation uh, doing the VNF orchestration since the open NFV uh, excluded the VNF yeah, orchestration and right. managing. So are, are you proposing that you're um, yeah, um, providing a product uh, which will be open for multi-vendor VNFs and you're uh, um, yeah, uh, placing a product on the market doing all the orchestration or are you looking for some open source implementation make this part of OpenStack or try to do you try to go with Heat or Tosker and things like that? So what's, what's the idea here to uh, make this interoperability with multi-vendors? Right, this is a very good question, and I'm trying to catch up, like, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the thinking is definitely you're right, and the challenge, as we also realize from Arizona perspective, is uh, truly the multi-vendor challenge. Like, the open source, it's very much encouraging, like, uh, all the vendors to contribute with the code, with, you know, like, uh, uh, ideas about functionalities, interface, et cetera, right? And so therefore, like, we want to call this, again, why we call the certification as OP and IV certification. The thinking is very much, we need to have certain standard uh, behind. And that's very much aligned because OP and IV is very much aligned with IT and IV uh, initiative. So the thinking is very much like you're saying, there are many for us today ongoing, like in terms of how we're going to align each other's functionality and each other's, uh, again, like solutions. So to believe, like what you're saying, orchestration is very much the, you know, currently again the phase one of uh, OP and FE is very much to speed up, you know, the ongoing activities so where we actually have a baseline so that we can work, you know, figure out how we can have a working uh, environment so that, uh, again, not only OpenStack, I would say all the other community would like to have a solution we felt like the operator can start working on. And then the phase two is very much to focus on orchestration and this manual focus, yeah. And that's very much the, the, the focus, I would say, the OP and the V community also today are working on, even though that we need to also realize for many operators is very much a migration thinking. Like from legacy uh, environment to virtualized environment is a big step for them. And so therefore we need to be very careful in, cho in choosing, like you're saying, which V and F should we focus on. Like uh, different uh, workload we have, again, like if you say virtual EPC compare virtual IMS, they have different, you know, requirements in terms of the, the underlayer, uh, you know, um, solutions. So that's a portion we're actually working together with the community. Uh, we do not believe that any one vendor can actually drive this. Neither Arizona or Huawei or, you know, Cisco or like HP can drive this alone. We need to work uh, together. So, yeah. So you're, um, you're basically saying that in phase two, open NFV is also picking up on the orchestration? Yes, yes. Or that's exactly the, the focus. If you look at Etsy NFV, it's phase two. That's exactly uh, the you focus. You had this yeah. uh, open NFV slide? Uh, yes, the previous one, yeah. Yes, 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 the one here. So, yeah, so I, I that's the phase two, it's a phase one focus, yeah. Yeah, okay, so yeah. in phase two, it will shift um, yes, yes, a, a exactly, exactly. Okay. But our, our certification, we want to start, is truly the yes. full, uh, full, you know, like full stack thinking. Like we're going to pick out the VNF, uh, you know, VNF portability is very much the focus for us. Okay. And uh, as the initial activity, yeah. Because we believe, like you said, this is a crucial part. Okay, yeah, yeah. okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, great. Okay. Any other questions? No? Okay, uh, thank you very much, Sinso, for coming today. And uh, yeah. myself and Shanang will be here if you have anything else right. you want to ask. Right. Thanks. Yeah.